Welcome to another edition of the Christ is All podcast. We are continuing our series entitled Candid Q&A about church and ministry. And you can listen to the previous episodes on this topic to hear the questions and our answers that have come before it. Jared is with me once again. Hello, and, hello. And the next question is, how do you respond to criticism? I heard a man tell this joke once. A guy goes to a doctor and the doctor says, you have a bad heart. It's going to give out soon. So you need surgery. To which the guy responded to the doctor, I want a second opinion. And the doctor said, okay, you're ugly too. <laughs> <laughs> and the point of that is not all opinions are legitimate and not all opinions should be listened to. So the first opinion, you have a bad heart, you need surgery. It would be wise for the guy to listen to his doctor in that respect with that opinion. But the second opinion, you're ugly, is irrelevant. Mm. This guy is married. His wife thinks he's handsome and attractive. He would be wise not to listen to that opinion, right? So the fact is not all criticism is the same and not all criticism should be paid attention to. Mm -hmm. I have... In my book, 48 Laws of Spiritual Power, a chapter entitled Distinguish Between Critics. It's law number 15. And I answer this question in some detail in that chapter. There are three kinds of critics. There are the supporters, mm -hmm. there are the objectors, and then there are the toxic trolls. Just because somebody has access to two earbuds and listens to your podcast, for example, does not mean that this podcast is for them, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah. So let's say that someone's listening to this podcast or the Insurgents podcast and they write an email that's critical and basically they want our podcast to be more like Joyce Meyer's podcast or T.D. <laughs> Jake's podcast or Joel Osteen's podcast or Rob Bell's mm -hmm. podcast. Well, I'm not any of those people and this podcast is not for that group. Yep. So such a person ought to listen to their podcasts, <laughs> right? I am speaking to a certain segment of the body of Christ. Books are the same way. Messages are the mm. same way, all right? Yeah. Not all criticism is the same, and not all criticism should be paid attention to. Much of it should be ignored. Let me give you an example in the book realm. The greatest books that have ever been written... If you look at them on Amazon, they have tons of five-star reviews, but they also have many one-star reviews, mm -hmm. all right? Most of those one-star reviews are simply saying one thing, that book was not for them. The point is, is that most criticism should be completely ignored, okay? There is a kind of criticism that is priceless, and I talk about what that criticism is and who it comes from in the book, 48 Laws of Spiritual Power. I said it there, I'm not gonna go over that. But the point that is so needed for people in ministry to hear is that you have to consider the source of the criticism. Is it a doctor who's giving you the opinion that you're ugly, okay? Mm -hmm. Or is it coming from someone to whom you're speaking and writing? And what is the nature of the criticism? So that's what I would say about criticism. And again, I point to chapter 15, law 15 in 48 laws of spiritual power. What say you? I would resonate with a lot of that because there is, I mean, in ministry, especially, you're always going to get criticism. And that's why it's so important to know who you are in Christ and that be your, your anchor in those things. There have been times when I've had criticism that I could look at the person and look at the rest of them, their life, and the rest of the things that they say. And I could say, well, this is, I, I considered the source. That's, I love that. My, my wife's grandma, Ruth, who I love dearly, would always talk about people. And she would just say when someone said something about another person and her response is, well, consider the source. And that was, that was it. You know, mm -hmm. we move on from that. There are criticisms that I've had. There are hard conversations that have come to me that I listened to because I knew the people. Mm -hmm. I considered the source. Mm -hmm. And so that's important. And I think if there are, if you ever have a time when you're trying, struggling, well, I don't know about the source, and maybe this is accurate, don't dwell on it yourself. But hopefully you have some trusted people that are the type that would bring you priceless 
criticism like what you're mm-hmm. talking about, mm-hmm. um, like I do. Um, and one of the people that I usually go to if I have any question about criticism, if I am looking at like, well, I can't just disregard it because of the source. There may be some truth to it because I'm a fallible person. I go to them and say, hey, um, mm-hmm. what have you seen of this? Right. Right. And they'll speak truth to me. Very when good. we've yeah. had had some some meetings with with the elders at my church where things come up, and they are people I trust, so I ask, "Is there any accuracy to this?" I don't think there is, but this is important enough for us us to talk about, and they're honest with me. You know, yeah. having those people that you trust right to help you and they're supporters. They're, yeah, supporters. they're supporters. This brings up uh, another issue that's really related. It is the importance of getting clear on who you are yes. speaking to. Who is your audience? And yes. I say that it is wise to find the smallest viable audience and serve them mm. and almost ignore everybody else yeah. all right and that takes time to get clear on who your audience is i know mm. who my audience is yeah my audience is not the masses of christians that are following the celebrity pop preachers and teachers that's not my audience mm. Now, there's some who do that, but they're rare (laughs) because I'm beating a different drum. I'm singing a different tune. And figuring out who you are serving is huge. And so I'm laser focused on the people I'm speaking to, my audience, and virtually ignore everyone else. Because if you allow criticism from the wrong people Mm -hmm. to enter your heart and affect your psyche, you'll get derailed. Yeah. I love what you said about laser focus and your audience. I think think of the difference between a shotgun and a rifle. Mm. Shotgun has a big spread and maybe close up it can, you know, can do damage. But you get 100 yards away, a shotgun is not going to be effective. Yes. In, in having an impact that a rifle round would. Mm. And I think that's with that idea of knowing your, knowing your audience, having that laser focus. I think that's a, um, that idea that we want to have impact. Right. And so look for this is who I am to serve. Mm. And if the criticism comes up from, from that, that place, mm. and it is criticism like, well, I'm, you know, it's not fulfilling this group that you're serving maybe you should look at it and consider it but go to your people you trust your your people who are um right. your right. encouragers right. well a good example of this is we've been spending three days here in this hotel in orlando and uh i have been non-stop with my criticisms of you so and you <laughs> received it i mean which is a good sign so you know it just depends who's giving the criticism anyway <laughs> So let's go on to the next question. Yes, that was a joke, folks. What is the most difficult aspect of ministry for you? And I will let you start this one. So I think a lot of it comes down to navigating the difference between the expectation that people have of you in ministry and following the lead of God in your ministry. Because I have found, and and as I think back, a lot of the struggles that I've had in ministry is because people have expectations of what you should be doing, what you should be about, what you should be saying, that don't at all match up with what God is calling me to. Mm -hmm. And God is leading me through. You would think that that would not be a problem for Christians. Well, God is leading you. Yes, do that. But I found that's not the case. And... I've sometimes successfully done that well and um, gracefully and redemptively navigated that. Other times I have failed to gracefully navigate that and have said things to people that were not always kind about that. And so, Mm -hmm. but navigating that difference between what people expect and think should happen and what God is leading me in, I think is is hard. Mm. For me, I would say it's two things. In the way of content creation, and I'm a content creator, obviously, I have two podcasts that I drop regularly. I write an article every week. I have a network where I produce content, messages, articles, etc. I write books. I create courses. In the area of content creation, 
the most difficult part is the editing. Mm. It's not the creation of the message or the podcast episode or the article or even the book. It's not the creation, it's the editing. <laughs> and that is tedious. Mm. It's difficult, it's exhausting. So that part of it is very hard. And if you're the author of a piece of work, only you can edit it to the point where it's going to reflect your mind and heart. Now, after that, you can give it to other editors, yeah. but you still have to edit. <laughs> so the content creation part of my work, that's the difficulty is the mm -hmm. editing. The other part is what I talked about in an earlier episode in this series on these questions and answers. It has to do with discouragement and mm -hmm. where the discouragement comes from. I'll give you one piece of where the discouragement comes from. I'm just giving you one. And that is when someone recommends a book of mine, I've written many books and you can see them on my website, frankviola.org forward slash books. It's when someone recommends a book of mine to the wrong audience. Okay. Mm. So a very, very old book of mine that was not a standalone. It's called Pagan Christianity. I wrote it with George Barna way back in 2008. That book was only written to a very narrow audience. People who had either left the institutional church, but mm -hmm. they still love Jesus. They still are following the Lord. They're still a Christian. All right. But they left the institutional form of church mm -hmm. or they were on their way out. That's the only audience. We were not writing to pastors. We were not writing to people who enjoy Sunday morning services. Mm -hmm. When a person gives or recommends that book to the wrong audience, it's terrible because it's not for them. It's like recommending a meat-eating book to a vegan, okay? <laughs> yeah. Wrong audience. It's like recommending a classic rock artist and their concert to someone who listens to hip-hop and country music mm. only, right? Wrong audience. So that's difficult just to see people continue to do that, even though I have <laughs> talked about it so many times, it still mm. happens. Uh, people misunderstanding. Yeah. And one of the very last questions that I will answer is a big, big misunderstanding that I want to address. So those are the things that are difficult in ministry. Again, I put it under the banner of discouragement, but in the content creation space, it's the editing that's hard. Okay. I'm a 35-year-old pastor, and I'm interested in your IXP mastermind. Can you tell me about it? All right, let me just freeze the frame. That is an encouraging question, hugely mm -hmm. encouraging. Yeah. Why? Because my mastermind is for pastors, mm -hmm. leaders mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. age range, yeah. you know, 30s, early 40s. That's the target. All right, because my eye is on the next generation. Mm -hmm. So to get a question like this is like gold because that's who I'm seeking to serve with that particular resource. The Insurgents Experience Mastermind is a four day intensive. It's a mixture of a training, a retreat, fellowship that's full of laughter and fun, a think tank, a spiritual encounter, <laughs> a mentoring experience all rolled up into one intensive experience of four days. And then there is also a year of training through a Facebook group with lots of exclusive content. I would say based on the testimonials, it has been life-changing, radically altering many, many lead pastors, teachers, missionaries, church planters, people who are in ministry, because that's who it's focused on. And I created my first mastermind in 2015. And even to this day, Jared, the average Christian leader has no clue as to what a mastermind is, even mm -hmm. though I've been talking about it. I, I didn't really. Right. I mean, you, you talked about it and I'm like, okay, I don't know what to expect still. Right. So yeah. Right. And I wrote an article at that time about what a mastermind is, and I'm going to put it in the show notes. I wish every Christian leader would read it. Uh, masterminds are way beyond a cohort. Mm. They're way beyond a pastoral fraternal. They're way beyond pastors networking groups. This is something completely different. And in 2015, for years, the masterminds that I facilitated and held were open to both women and men, right? Now, all of my resources, all of my conferences are open to women and men. The Deeper Christian Life Network, open to women and men. The seminars that I have done, the Buzz Seminar, 
uh, for example, the scribe training seminar when we had it a lot, women and men. The only time that I reduced it to men only was a few years ago, and it's this Insurgents Experience Masterminds. The only resource I have that's only for the brothers, okay? The reason is because we discuss men's issues. Mm -hmm. And men are not going to be comfortable, I know this from experience, yeah. if there are women in the room, to discuss that. Anyway, talk about it from firsthand experience. Speak to the lead pastors. Speak to the teachers, the missionaries, the church planters, the Bible college professors, anybody who is in leadership, you preach and or teach regularly. You went through the mastermind last year. For me, it was a wonderful experience and it was um, eye-opening. Like one of the things that Frank and I were talking about last night is how in the world did you end up in doing the mastermind? You know, it was really the spirit leading, but I had a connection with someone who had gone through it. And as I looked at it, I'm like, okay, this is what I need to do. You know, I just very clear to me as I talked to my friend and as I looked at it and I prayed about it, I'm like, okay. But for me, the, some of the, the big takeaways were some of what Frank calls the handles and practices and coming to things from a fresh perspective. Um, because we, especially if you are in a traditional church or you're, you know, teaching in like a, a seminary or whatever it is, you have a certain view of things that we very easily get stuck in a rut. And so coming to this mastermind, this experience, one of the things I loved about it is you had people from different walks of mm -hmm. ministry. Yeah. You know, you, we had missionaries. We had people who were part of a, a house church that were leaders there. We had pastors that were in traditional churches in different denominations and different sizes of churches. Mm -hmm. But we all came together and on equal footing, we shared mm -hmm. life together and we we learned some of the handles and practices that, that Frank employs and how that affects us. We, we saw that firsthand because we, for that intensive four days, practiced those mm. together in community. Mm. That's something for me that, that was very formative. We did a uh, reunion of the mastermind last year, meaning the previous mastermind group that preceded yours, they wanted to get together and do another yeah. <laughs> intensive. So uh, we were together at the end of last year and uh, it was explosive, life-changing for many of the guys per their testimonies. And at the very end of it, some of them had to leave when it was completed. This was after it was all over, but some of them remained back because their planes didn't leave until that evening. And so I just sat down with them and I just said, talk about, talk about the week. You know, mm. tell us your impressions your reactions and they shared and I recorded it and so uh, I will play that on this podcast at some okay. point but if you are a spiritual leader you preach and or teach regularly on a regular basis <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that word and you're in your 30s 40s I would encourage you to go to ministrymind.org ministrymind.org Wait for it to redirect. It will redirect you to the IXP Mastermind page. And you can read all about it. And it will take you two minutes to fill out the application. I encourage you to do so. If you're older or you're younger, say you're in your 20s and you're in ministry, or you're older, 50s, 60s, etc. We do have another edition of the Mastermind that's all on Facebook. And you get a lot of the same content that the in-person version has. I'm doing that right now with a group of 23 leaders. We don't have an in-person component, but we are engaged going through the exercises, the trainings every week in that group. So there is that for you as well. And if you are a brother or sister, but you're not in ministry and you want high level mentoring and connection, there is the Deeper Christian Life Network. Just type in the deeperchristianlifenetwork.com and you can join the waitlist and be a part of that when it opens. All right, next question. The research shows that the majority of pastors in the United States suffer from depression. And from my experience in ministry, this is true. Well, this is according to the pastor who wrote this in. What would you say to a pastor struggling with depression? I'll start with this. The first thing I would say to you is 
to evaluate whether or not God has called you to the present role you're in, all right? Mm -hmm. Let me explain that. There have been many, many men who I have talked to and had relationships with even who knew they were called to the Lord's work mm -hmm. early in their life at their conversion or post-conversion. They had a call in their life, right? But the only options available to them according to their knowledge are you're either a pastor, a missionary, or a worship leader mm -hmm. or someone on the worship team. That's yep. it. Yeah. Boom. That's it. There's nothing else. So many of them opted for the pastorate. Now this isn't true for every person, but for many of them years later, fulfilling that role and going through depression, mm -hmm. <laughs> they stepped back and realized that, wait a minute, they came to the knowledge that there are other ministries other than those three, mm. pastor, missionary, worship leader. And so now some of them, they've left the pastorate and they are now in a ministry. Some of them are traveling teachers. Mm -hmm. Some of them are involved in church planting. Some are involved in other aspects of ministry. And the depression's gone mm -hmm. because they were in the wrong role. It wasn't that they weren't called by God. It yeah. was the way they interpreted the call of God. So that's the first thing I would say to you. Evaluate if you are currently serving in the ministry that God has called you to, or mm -hmm. if you misinterpreted the call, that's the first one. The second thing is, if you are where the Lord wants you, okay, it's vital that you have peers in your life. It's mm -hmm. vital that yes. you have some people to whom you can talk. Now, I will say this, we just talked about the mastermind, the insurgents experience mastermind. The very first time I did it, there was a brother who was a spiritual leader. At some point in the mastermind, he admitted to us all, it was difficult for him to do, but he felt very safe with us because one of the things we do, all the masks come off. Mm -hmm. We're not no. pretending to be religious and mm -hmm. we don't talk differently and <laughs> we're just ourselves. And he said, I have struggled with depression for many years and mm -hmm. I have suicidal ideation and it's very dark by the time the mastermind was over and every one of the brothers was testifying about the impact it had he said to us i have not had joy mm -hmm. like this in eight years that was the power of christ-centered community because one of the things we do is we encounter the lord in yeah. new and fresh ways so that's one. And then another one is if you cannot get through the depression and you've tried many different things. And if it was me, here's what I would do. I would get on YouTube and I would search everything I can find on depression, not just coming from the Christian camp, psychologists, therapists in the non-Christian world. Mm -hmm. I would look at all of it. I would study it from... A to Izzard, I would learn everything I could about it. You know, brain chemistry, mm -hmm. environmental factors, the way you were reared, everything. And I would become an expert in depression. And out of that, I would seek the Lord. I would ask him to enlighten me as to how I can get over this. And that may lead me to see a therapist, yeah. which would require some research because not all therapists are evil. Yep. But uh, that's what I would say, mm -hmm. all of those things together. And uh, I default to you now, Jared. One of the things I think about this question is, and, and kind of even when you were talking about community, one of the, the challenges of a pastor um, that results in pastors dealing with anxiety, dealing with depression, dealing with addiction, is a lot of times pastors find themselves more and more isolated. Mm. So that's, that's the idea of making sure you have a community is vital um, and I, I agree with the research so mental health in my family is important I have uh, my wife and my daughter both um, are neurodivergent they um, suffer from obsessive compulsive spectrum disorder um, and so when when Frank talks about the research and, and learning as much as you can that's what we've done we know a whole bunch um, about how things affect my wife and my daughter, what things trigger, what things they can do with diet. I think that is a great, mm. great thing to think through. Well, how do I, how do I treat that? You know, what are some health issues? Am I exercising? Because that's one of the things they say that will help. I, I will say also, it's great to get help, you know, um, and I, I 
resonate like Frick and I talked a little bit about this but to make sure you get the right help sometimes you know when we moved um, from Oklahoma we had to find therapy options for my daughter and it took a while of doing the research looking through and finding someone who could actually do what was needed for pastors like and this is my personal experience when I have, I have, I've struggled with anxiety. In anxiety and depression, many, many therapists and, and psychiatrists look at them as two sides of the same coin mm, yeah. because they're very related. But when I have seen therapists and psychiatrists, I look for ones that are um, someone that I can relate to, that are, are, are Christians who happen to be therapists and they're um, faithful. And so for me, um, several years ago, when I was in um, Indiana, I was dealing with some anxiety through some of the things that we were doing and looking at my mental health. And so I met with one who was a former pastor, who knew kind of where I was, knew kind of what was going on. That matters, you know. And so I, I think find that help and find, you know, that some people have this idea that, well, if, if I need help and I try it once and it doesn't work, then that means it just doesn't work for me. And that's one thing right. that with my, my daughter, we actually, when she was looking, when we were looking at her anxiety and we were thinking she had obsessive compulsive disorder because it's genetic, we actually had to go to see a couple different therapists to find the one that clicked with right. her and that, that would help her. And so I think that's, um, that's important. Depression and anxiety are twins or cousins depression largely looks at the past where anxiety largely looks, looks at, at the, the future. future and you're right just like all doctors are not created equal all therapists all psychiatrists are not mm -hmm. created equal all lawnmower people are, are not, not created <laughs> equal uh, so just because you see a therapist and maybe you don't see results does not mean that you should necessarily end there and you know luke was a doctor I know there's a segment, a very small segment of the Christian population that believes that seeing psychiatrists or seeing a therapist indicates you don't have faith in God. You can't really swear that with the New Testament, but that's another conversation. You should have no shame in any of these things. 